Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. In the spotlight is Andromeda Romano Lax. She's an author born in Chicago, born and raised in Chicago, and now a resident of Vancouver Island, Canada. Uh, she worked uh, as a freelance journalist and travel writer before turning to fiction. Her first novel was titled The Spanish Bow. It was translated into 11 languages. Her next three novels, The Detour, Behave, which was an Amazon Book of the Month selection, and Plum Rains, winner of the Sunburst Award, reflect her diverse interests in arts, history, science, and technology, as well as her passion for travel and her time spent living abroad. Andromeda co-founded and continues to blog for 49 Writers, which is a nonprofit organization. She has also uh, taught fiction at the University of Alaska Anchorage, uh, low residency, MFA program in creative writing, and currently works with novelists and memoirists as a freelance book coach. And her uh, activities include trail running and paddle boarding, incidentally. Andromeda, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for the great introduction, Mike. Well, you have a really interesting background, and uh, uh, I wanted to make sure the readers knew how you kind of came around to all of this. You know, in your name itself, as soon as I heard your name, I'm thinking mom or dad was an astronomer. You have a really cool and unusual name. Where did Andromeda come from? Is there a story behind it? Yeah, you're really close. My mom was taking an astronomy class, and then she went on to become a neuropsychologist. So not an, not an astro uh, astronomer, but yes, a scientist, and that's reflected in the name. Okay, interesting. So how did you... Here you were a journalist, freelance journalist, a travel journalist, and then you, you turned to fiction. What happened that, uh, what was the triggering event that made you say, I'm going to start writing some fiction here? Yeah, it was completely unexpected. It was 9-11. Um, so a very sharp turning point. I was a nonfiction writer up until then. I didn't even read much fiction. Um, early on, I had wanted to be uh, an immersion journalist and travel writer, and then that's what I was. And I was working on uh, a book that uh, was about environmental issues, um, especially marine-oriented environmental issues. It was a sort of book that's really important, but I, I, I had not figured out a way to tell it. I wasn't sure there was going to be much of a readership. I felt like I was just trying to tell the world about things they didn't want to know. So this is you know going back 20 years. And then 9-11 happened. And just as it struck other people as sort of a, a moment when you pause and think, what is life really about? You know, if I, if I could do only one thing, what would I do? I realized that I wanted to write something beautiful. And the most beautiful thing for me at that time was cello music. I was obsessed with the cello. So then I started trying to write a nonfiction book about one of the world's most famous cellists, Pablo Casals. Um, just a couple months after 9-11, my family and I went to Puerto Rico for a month to begin that research. And as soon as I started digging in, I realized that uh, that nonfiction was not going to be the most engaging way to tell the story, that it was a bigger story I wanted to tell about musicians uh, in Europe, about politics, about World War II, and that the best way to tell it would be to use all the tools of fiction and to have more freedom to, you know, come up with plot lines and make up composite characters um, and explore kind of broader themes. So I was just ready just to dive in and do that. But I had no training. I'd never studied English in college, hadn't taken a single regular English course. Um, and like I said, I hadn't even read broadly enough. Um, so I was I was in that sense at a real disadvantage. Um, but the advantage I had was that I was just in love with the subject and I wasn't thinking about readers at all. I couldn't even imagine that it would be published. And so that gave me a wonderful kind of freedom that I've never had mm. since. <laughs> so so yeah. it was all just great fun. I just did the research in Puerto Rico and then went to Europe, um, did research in Spain and um, southern France. And, um, and then soon after that, got an agent and it was published. You know, we... 
we just talked about this a little bit on the podcast that went live today um, with Ray J. Perot, and it was kind of this conversation around writing for yourself, not your readers. Here you wrote a book that you were fearless about because you weren't thinking about the readers. You were writing it for your own purposes is what it sounds like. And you had this tremendous sense of freedom and you were able to write. I, I think it's one of the things that holds people back from actually expressing their own voice. They're thinking about whether that voice appeals or sounds novelistic or appeals to the readers. And in this case, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you found yourself with, as you said, the freedom like you've never had with writing before. Yes. And yes, exactly. And, you know, even my own family, my own husband was kind of, I have to say, kind of laughing at me. You know, he knew how hard it was to make a living as a nonfiction writer. And then here I was going to write something that we thought was maybe the most obscure thing possible, um, a novel about an old cranky male cellist in Europe. And um, so but for whatever reason, I, yeah, I was, I need, it was a story I needed to tell myself. Yeah. I think if I had thought too much about those specific readers and critics, then I would have just been questioning, especially trying to write um, a man's voice from another country. You know, I would have been questioning constantly. Am I, is this credible? Am, is this coming across um, correctly? Instead, I was more channeling it. It was almost like just seeing the movie in my mind. I remember at the time being inspired by the movie uh, Cinema Paradiso. Um, with these scenes of a boy in Italy and just, and, and that's where my story starts in the Spanish boat it starts with this young boy in Spain falling in love with the cello. And I just wanted to inhabit that character and just be him and speak in his voice. And yes, it was very freeing to not worry about, not just to not worry about readers, but not to not worry about the market. You know, I had no idea what kind of market there might or might not be for this kind of a book. Exactly. So the Spanish bow, your first novel. So having had that experience, were your subsequent novels and today, do you still write the same way with, without uh, concern for that audience, but allowing yourself to just authentically uh, channel whatever your subject matter is? Not as often as I would like, Mike. I started smiling as soon as you started asking the question because, gosh, I wish. But no, I've become more and more aware of the market. Um, I am writing something right now that uh, that's so fresh I can't talk about it in too much detail, but it is such a challenge to write and I can anticipate so much criticism for what I'm trying to do that again, it's almost freed me because I'm like, there's no way to do this without getting criticized. So that almost takes me back to, to square one of just saying, you know, who cares? I'm doing this for myself. Um, right. Where I've had to think about the market the most is I've, I've also tried doing some writing more in the suspense thriller genre and that there's a lot more formula there and it's a very hot market right now. And there's a lot of expectations for things like number of twists and you're well aware of which stories have been kind of done to death and what maybe hasn't been done to death. It's hard to write something like that for me without being really aware of the market and what other books are out there and how they're being talked about. So this one is a thriller that you're working on? Well, so I have a thriller that's finished that hopefully will be published in a couple years. And then I had started on another one and uh, bogged down a little bit and took a break from it and jumped into what I would call a cheat novel. So this is a whole topic we can get into. So, so again, I was working on thriller number two, and it's not like that it wasn't going right, but again, maybe I was thinking too much about the market and what I was allowed to do and not allowed to do. And I was losing track of what really excited me about that book, which was some of the themes. Um, so I set that one aside, or, or wait, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a step back, Mike. I didn't quite set it aside. First, I started getting called by this other new idea for a book that is um, partly historical fiction. I started getting called to it and I knew I couldn't let myself get distracted. Um, so I kept telling myself, no, no, don't, don't cheat on this second book idea. Um, but at the same time, I had one night that I stayed up late and, 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 and sitting with some you know, gin, a gin tonic and some tortilla chips. I stayed up a couple extra hours and was making notes for this cheat novel and then I said, okay, now put it out of my mind. And then a couple months goes by and the thriller number two is starting to bog down. And I said, okay, let me take a break and just start playing with this new novel idea. And then that's the one that has taken off. So this whole notion of do you let yourself write two things at once? If something else calls to you, when do you switch over to it? That's something that's been interesting me in the last year. But right but now I'm just having also, fun. 
But isn't that also the tricks that our mind plays on ourselves? We are working on something. We have other ideas in mind that we think, well, that'll be the next book or maybe the next book. And then we start thinking, well, you know, I have a lot more more fire for that one right now. This one's getting bogged down. I should just give this one up and go to that one now. I can always come back to this other one later. Have you had that experience where your mind just starts trying to uh, throw you off track and just basically abandon the project. This is hard work anyway, and it's another form of procrastination. Yes, always. I think that's why that's why I'm using the term kind of cheat book, hokey book. I think it's 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 dangerous. I think for the most part, most of the time, we need to just stick with the main project. And that's because, um, and Mike, I, I don't know if this comes up in all your podcast interviews, but, but what I found, especially working with my book coaching clients, other people working on books, you know, they'll say, oh, I'm getting bored with this. And I have to tell them, no, we always get bored with our books Um, in the middle. Often, you know, it starts bogging down in the middle. And then especially when you're in the revision process and novels can be revised, you know, half dozen or more times. And you think I'm so sick to death of this novel. And so there's number one, you can't really see it clearly. You get what I call draft blindness. And then number two, you just go get so incredibly bored with it. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, it does happen most of the time. And I think most of the time you have to ignore it and not cheat. <laughs> but then once in a while, the thing that you're wanting to cheat with is the really exciting project and you should let it pull you away. So that's why I was kind of interested in that question. I actually went and talked to a couple other authors and I wrote a little essay about this actually that just came out in a magazine called Oh Reader, which is available at Barnes and Noble right now. Um, I talked to a couple other authors um, and I found out, I'm going to give you one example, author named Jen Phillips. And she was working on a sprawling historical novel. And then she suddenly got this idea for this other more thriller oriented novel. She let herself cheat on it. She wrote it very quickly and it ended up um, coming out and uh, ended up being one of my favorite uh, books that I read in the last couple of years. It's called Fierce Kingdom. So sometimes the books that, you know, are the, that, that make us want to cheat are the ones that like we have so well formed in our minds and you can just kind of set project one aside, go over to number two, write it kind of quickly and then come back to number one. And so the question is, when should you do that? And when should you not do that? Mm. You know, I totally resonate with the, I, that experience is one that I've certainly had where you get so bored with your own work, especially in the revision process. Just like you said, you just want to be done with it and move on to something else. And um, the other thing that, uh, and by the way, that has not been a recurring theme on the podcast. That I think that's the first time it's been mentioned in that way. Now, I want to get back to this whole idea of, you know, you wrote that first book without, uh, you're thinking about your audience now, because, because that's what we do. And, and oftentimes, it's necessary because um, agents want that, editors want that. And, uh, and we want to be more successful commercially. Do you, do you feel that you're still writing in your own voice or do you feel like your vo voice has become something that you manipulate to, to the, uh, to the occasion? Yeah, that's a good question. For me, voice is not a problem because I can't identify my own voice in books. And I don't think of it as my voice. I think of it more as a different voice for each book based on the needs of that book. So often it'll be the voice of the main character of that book or something about that world or that genre. So I, I feel like my voice changes a bit book to book. So it's not that I feel like I lose voice or the voice gets adapted because of market or external concerns. What does happen is, for example, structure, you know, like pacing. How quickly does a novel have to be paced based on market considerations or reader expectations? How complicated can it be? I, I personally have a love for hybrid books that don't fit easily in the bookstore. So, for example, um, my most recent book, Annie and the Wolves, it has a historical thread based on the life of Annie Oakley, but not the kind of sentimental Broadway Annie Oakley. It's um, This is a more serious novel that has issues of sexual abuse in it and um, and revenge and darker emotions. There's a darker palette there. So I have this historical thread that's about Annie Oakley. And then I have a modern thread, which is more of a thriller. And it's about a woman who is researching the life of Annie Oakley, 
But while she's doing that, there is something very bad coming to her own town. And she's had a vision of the, of the near future involving someone she loves where she feels like an act of violence is coming to her town. So that's a book. You've got a historical piece. You've got a modern day, you know, historian researching something piece, and then it becomes more and more a thriller. And that's more hybrid. And it requires the reader to set aside a lot of expectations. And it requires the reader to do more work whenever she is toggling between those different strands and has to remember this is happening in the historical part and this is happening in the modern part. And there's maybe four POVs, you know. So that's where the market does influence me when I start worrying about readers, you know, wanting things to be simpler or not willing to do the work or wanting to understand everything within the first chapter. That's what ties me up in knots sometimes. Interesting. So getting back to Spanish Bow a second, uh, you were thinking, is there even a market for this book? You write the book, it gets translated into 11 languages. So that must have been a bit of a surprise for you that, that it got translated. That, that yeah, and we really did not have trouble finding a publisher. Um, it was it went to auction, so there was more than one publisher interested in it, and then and then the foreign editions, and that was all completely unknown to me. I mean, it's not even like I knew that that happened, but I didn't think it would happen to me. I didn't even know it happened. I didn't know what auction meant. I didn't know how foreign translations worked. And so it was just one new thing after another, and it was incredibly exciting, and it changed my life, and it changed my family's life. Now, do you call your, so my notes say here that you uh, re refer to yourself as an accidental historical fiction writer. Is that, does that uh, harken back to what you were just talking about in the integration of Annie Oakley into, into uh, the one book you did? I think with a lot of my books, so like with the Spanish bow, you know, I went into that project thinking of myself as a journalist, um, possibly a biographer, and then turned into a historical novelist. And then several times successively, I didn't go looking for another historical fiction story idea. I thought, oh, I, I, I would have imagined myself more as a contemporary novelist setting something in contemporary times. But then what happens is I'll come across a footnote or, you know, just some obscure little bit of information. And before I know it, I'm researching like crazy and coming up with a story. So I don't keep looking for these historical issues. They keep kind of coming to me. And that maybe gets at the question of why read historical fiction. For me, I'm rarely interested in the past just for past sake. I'm interested in what the past can illuminate about today when it's hard to see an issue in our present day. And we can sometimes see it more easily at a distance, whether it's in the past or in another culture or in another country, that's what interests me. Mm, interesting. So um, you are a, a freelance uh, book coach, writing coach, book coach. Uh, I know our listeners are going to be interested in knowing what are the major issues that you see when you get a manuscript from a client and you delve into that. Uh, highlight for us what are the most common problems Sure. Yes. And I work with both memoirists and novelists primarily. And I, I also have, I've worked, I, I worked for five years. I think you mentioned this in the intro in an MFA program. So in a university program, um, book coaching allows me to do, I think more efficiently what can be done in an MFA program, which is having that mentorship with a writer and somebody who can help you get that bigger, bigger picture view. Um, but even in MFA programs, this really interests me as a teacher, it's really easy to get into that workshopping model where you only look at a chapter at a time instead of looking at a whole work. And that's a real problem because uh, for some writers, you know, they may just be starting in the wrong place or they may write beautifully on the sentence level, whether they're writing nonfiction or fiction. But that doesn't mean they figured out what the story is. It doesn't mean the character moves along an arc. It doesn't mean that the whole thing works on the, on the big scale. So that's what I try to do for clients. I especially, or, or rather you ask me, what, what are the problems I see most often? The, the biggest problem I see mm -hmm. most often is somebody not having that big picture view of what their story is really about, whether it's memoir or a novel. And so it really helps me to, to read the whole manuscript. And often it's only once I get to the end that I get a sense of where maybe they could restructure or maybe where they were heading and what needs to be left out and what could be developed much more. You know, um, 
you were asked, I asked you to send me, you know, some some notes on uh, uh, this conversation, um, some things that we might talk about or some of your your thoughts. And you wrote, telling multi-layered slash hybrid stories, I have combined speculative fiction with historical fiction and combined real life individuals with imaginary ones and often write multiple timelines. Um, I was going to ask you to unpack that a little bit. You have already kind of explained that. Is there any any more uh, that you would um, add to that? It's not unusual for people to take fictional characters and imaginary ones, or uh, rather imaginary uh, uh, individuals, imaginary characters with real life individuals. That that's that's become pretty common. Um, El Doctoro mastered that, I think, among others. Oh, I love El Doctoro. Yeah. So, uh, so I, could address, I, could address, I could address in the it. multiple time and, and you also I, I think the multiple timelines is interesting. What do you mean ex- exactly by multiple timelines? Are these shifts like uh, flashbacks and uh, time changes? No. So not just flashbacks. So I'll give it. So I gave the example, Annie, the wolves, but I'll, I'll use another book. So the, my book before Annie and the wolves was plum rains. And that story takes place on two different timelines oh, in the there's a near future timeline in which a Filipino nurse is working for an elderly Japanese lady in 2029 Tokyo. And um, the Filipina nurse finds herself, finds her career at risk, her job at risk, because the family orders a new model AI empathetic robot to come into the house. And so this robot is so good at elder care that it threatens to replace the Filipina nurse. Um, and this is something that is speculative near future, but is really quite realistic. It's coming to us very soon. <laughs> so, hmm. and so in that storyline, we're looking at labor issues. We're looking at the relationship between two women of different cultures. We're looking at this AI um, uh, robot who is evolving in its first weeks as it gets to know its new client, the Japanese woman. That's the near near future, you know, almost modern timeline. But then I have another timeline, which is 1930s Taiwan, and it's uh, specifically Aboriginal or Indigenous rural Taiwan. And there's an essential connection between a character who's in the near future story in Japan and a character who was living in 1930s Taiwan. And there's also a thematic connection about how people are surviving and thriving and dealing with change and dealing with trauma in both of those timelines. So... So yes, there's a character, one specific character that's connecting the timeline. Um, And then there's also thematic things. And yeah, it's not, I'm not the only one to do this. There's lots of books out there that have the two, two different timelines going back and forth. They are trickier to write. I love to read them. I love when somebody surprises me with how they put them together. So that's the timeline issue. And then you brought up the other one, which, as you said, many people do, which is take a realistic historical time period, maybe some issues that are going on in that time period, have some famous real characters uh, or characters based on real historical people, but then have some uh, imagined characters. So in this case, my second novel was called The Detour, and it took place in 1938, Italy and Germany. Um, the real life starting point was uh, was Hitler. In real life, Hitler became obsessed with a classical statue called the discus thrower. And he wanted to acquire it. He wanted to buy it from Italy against the objections of much of the Italian public. But, but Hitler really wanted this statue. And maybe some listeners, um, if they've ever heard of the discus thrower, maybe they can picture it. It's a man. He's crouching down, getting ready to let go of the discus. But what that statue represented for Hitler was the perfect body, the Narian, uh, the uh, Aryan ideal. So that's the real life starting point. I, in my book, invented a German art curator, a naive young man who really doesn't want to get involved with politics, but it's his job to go to Rome, pick up the statue, transport it over three days back to Germany. And while he's on a road trip, it becomes a more of a personal quest for him. He gets to know some Italians. He falls in love. He's transported by the beauty of Italy. And it really starts not only challenging his ideas in terms of what he is doing with the statue, but makes him realize things about his own past. Okay. So that was a fairly long explanation, but so we have the real historical issue with, with Hitler and the acquisition of art, which Hitler continued to do all the Nazis stole first, they bought art and then they just started stealing art. Um, and then I have the imaginary character who's sort of our our lens for that time period. 
Now, there's a lot of aspiring novelists who are told first thing, um, don't try to bite off a novel. That's a big project. Start with short stories. You don't believe that's good advice. Why not? Thank you, Mike. You brought up this is this is my one little like hot button issue um, because I, yeah, I really don't believe that you learn to write the novel by writing short stories. I think short stories are wonderful, but they're they're really they're different. They're different in terms of uh, plot and character and theme, and and it's not like you can write one to to learn to write the other. Um, just in terms of this whole issue of biting off more than you can chew. I think everyone should do that. I think that's how you learn to write. I think you take on something that seems way bigger than anything you could do. Um, and then you have to get to the end of it. At least we were talking about, don't get distracted uh, unnecessarily. Um, you have to get to the end of a first draft to even have any hint of what you're trying to say. And then once you have a hint of what you're trying to say, you can go back and start going through those revisions. So I think it's really important to take on um, really the form that you want to write and then take on a big project. I mean, you know, Spanish bow required me to know about cello music and Spanish culture and Spanish civil war and all this stuff that then required me to do tons of research, which was a wonderful experience. Um, the discus thrower went on a trip to, I went on a trip with my family to Italy to actually see art. And we went to uh, also Germany to research some of the art pieces in the novel. Um, so I think that's the exciting thing about writing is, is going bigger than, 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 people would tell you, you should do. Um, but the other thing is in terms of what people should write, I think the first question they should ask themselves is what do they love reading? Because that, that's a big giveaway to me. A lot of my students who have have who are working on short stories, when you ask them what they actually read the most, they say they read novels. So you can tell that's really their dream. And whatever it is that you're reading is going to be already imprinting itself on your mind in terms of patterns. I'm, you know, so to be trying to do one form because a teacher tells you to do it when really what you love is something else, that's that's not a recipe for success. Interesting. So uh, you talk about um, that you believe people are most quickly by just jump, just write. Get, get writing, write the novel, take on the big project. and But you also say reading as writers. So now, is that what you were just talking about now? Because when I think about reading, when I read, I know I read differently than a non-writer because I'm reading for something different. I'm reading for turns of phrase, characterizations, pacing. I'm, I'm analyzing while I read. Is that uh, uh, what you're alluding to there? Or was it the, this whole idea of you're trying to figure out what's right? What is it that you love to read? And then I think it's an interesting point you make about you've got those patterns, those, those rhythms already uh, imprinted on your mind. So it's going to come more naturally to you to then suddenly darting out into some other genre or some other or just general fiction or what have you. Um, so I didn't keep that question very succinct, but I'll let you <laughs> suss it out. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you should look to see what, you know, what are the books that you wish you you could have written and try to write that kind of book. And then while you're writing it, continue to read. Um, and here, here's a really interesting thing about reading for me. You can read a lot of books before you start writing and that'll help a little bit. But what helps the most, I think, is while you're writing a project to continue to read because suddenly as you hit each problem, that problem itself is going to change your level of attention. So if I'm writing a book and first in the beginning, I'm like, well, how do I grab the reader? What's a good opening? And now I open up five or 10 other novels. I'm going to pay a lot more attention to that opening part later on when it's like, okay, am I, how am I handling dialogue? Well, now suddenly dialogue is going to jump out to me on the page and I'm going to be noticing everything from the formatting to what, di what dialogue accomplishes to what it shouldn't be used for. And on and on. So I think until we're actually struggling with the problem, we're, we can't actually notice as many things. So it's this back and forth between reading and writing. I think you should just keep doing both of them. And then again, you finish a whole draft of your novel. And it's always a good idea to set it aside for as long as you can stand to set it aside, maybe three months. As soon as you set aside that novel and go maybe have a little more time to read even more deeply, you're going to pick up the next couple books and you're going to think, oh, I should have done this, or maybe this would have been the solution to my problem. It, it's never a question of copying books, because I don't think we can copy books even if we even if we tried. If, if it was easy, we'd all be writing you know, Gone Girl or something, which is a great book. Um, but it certainly is a question of noticing 
you know, structures, language, um, different tricks that the writer is using and then trying to adapt it to our own stories. Interesting. Now, also, you talk about abandoned, um, well, actually rediscovering old drafts. Is that something that's happened to you where you set something aside because it wasn't working at the time or maybe you, uh, for whatever reason, and then you went back and dusted it off and thought, hey, this has real potential and I'm, you know, the ideas are popping now. I see this thing growing. Yeah, it's happened for me both on the short term and the long term. So the short term where you set something aside for three or six months and you pick it up and you immediately can see stuff you didn't see before. Like, oh, this is how I should, you know, it shouldn't, this shouldn't be the main character. This should be the main character. I should structure it differently. So that's on the short term level. Um, on the long term level, my one of my biggest failed novels, what, what I thought was going to be my failed novel was around 2010. I set aside the novel that is now published as Annie and the Wolves, my most recent novel. But in 2010, I set it aside feeling like it was a complete failure and, and having no idea how to rescue it. And that's even though my agent at the time, she didn't tell me to set it aside. She she liked parts of it. Um, but there were other things that just were not working. And so this is this book that has the historical piece and it has a modern day thriller piece and it has some issues of sexual abuse and, and revenge. Um, and the, the seed for this story was autobiographical. So my father sexually abused my two sisters. Um, and it was when he was on his deathbed um, and we were, we were contacted by family members who had no idea why we'd stopped being in contact with him years earlier. And they said, um, you know, he's, he's going to be passing soon. This is your chance to go visit him. And at that time, my sister said, well, if I were going to go visit him, I, I, I would consider bringing a gun. And so I knew there was, there was actually a real chance that she would consider going and threatening him or exacting, you know, some revenge on him. And I thought about, well, what is my role in this? You know, what kind of confrontation should I be willing to be part of or not part of and what's going to happen? Okay. So none of that did happen with my father, but that planted the seed of a story about revenge. And at the very same time, I happened to read a footnote about the fact that Annie Oakley, the famous 1800s sharpshooter was sent away to live with a farm family for two years and they abused her, which is something I never known about Annie Oakley. So those elements came together and I wanted to write this abuse and revenge story. Okay. So I tried and I made a whole lot of mistakes. I sent my characters on a really boring road trip. I had all the exciting stuff happen at the end of the novel, which is never a good idea. And I'd even chosen the wrong main character. I had the main character being a writer as in a novelist who was trying to tell the story. And obviously that was me, you know, that was my autobiographical role in the story. Basically, I was that writer. So, so much of that didn't work. The theme still interested me, though. The Annie Oakley piece interested me and the question of what happens to people who try to seek revenge, that interested me. So set the whole novel aside um, and right at the uh, at the very end, I, I've done this a couple of times where as I'm setting something aside, and when I say set it aside, you know, we used to put, we used to call them drawer novels because you'd put a big stack of pages in a drawer, but now it's often digital. So, you know, I'll have different folders for each book. But what I've done more than once is when I'm just about completely giving up on a project, uh, which kind of frees me because now I've decided it's never going to uh, be a success anyway. Then I'll take a moment. And I'll think, gosh, what else? How else could I have told the story? So I wrote a couple different openings to this failed novel. And then I put them in a folder and I closed the folder. This is way back in around 2010 and then didn't look at it again. In the meanwhile, I wrote two other novels. And then in 2008, I was looking for what is my next novel going to be? And I went looking through my folders and I, I read this last minute attempt to resuscitate novel version of the opening. <laughs> and I know I'm making this really long, Mike. Um, and when I read that opening, I had no memory of it all because so many years had passed that even though I wrote it, I had forgotten what on earth I was doing. And and I was so curious, well, if this is how I rest was going to restart this novel, where could I have gone with it? And that curiosity freed me to be much more playful and to get rid of almost everything except for the core themes and some of the little historical um, facts. And so I really started with a page one rewrite of that novel and wrote it over 
maybe two years and then, and then was able to sell it to my publisher without, without too much difficulty. Um, but so, so a really important part of that was giving up on the book. Um, but right before I gave up experimenting with, well, what, uh, what else could I have done? But then putting it out of my mind and completely just, you know, forget about the wishes for the outcome and then opening it back up again and, and being willing to play with it. Again, kind of like with the Spanish bow, playing with it without the expectation of readers, without the expectation of any reward. And that's what brought it to life for me again. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's heavy stuff, starting with the, the whole sexual abuse scenario and all that. Wow. Um, you say that um, your most productive research happens while traveling, traveling abroad. You've lived in Taiwan. You've lived in Mexico. And of course, you, you, know, you like to travel. You were a travel writer, for crying out loud. Yeah. Um, so is the research, cause you've obviously done research where you've traveled to a specific place because you're working on that. But then, you know, my own experience is that when I travel, my energy and creativity are at a higher level because I've, I've, I've broken out. I'm somewhere else. It's very, very stimulative. So for the, so I'm, I guess I'm asking, obviously you've done it on the, on the one hand where you're going to a location because it's the subject matter is set there. Um, do you also just find that, uh, um, I mean, that's a research part of it. Do you also find though that when you're traveling just generally that you're more productive or more creative? Well, I certainly notice more, which is maybe as part of what you're alluding to. I think that's why it's so wonderful when we're in our own home environments, we come, we become blind to what is overly familiar to us. And so that's really hard as a writer. Like how do you describe something in a fresh way if it's in your own natural environment or your own social environment. But when you're traveling, you know, every single day, it's like your senses are alive and you're just noticing everything and you can be journaling about it or even keeping a sketchbook. And that's so much easier to turn that into nonfiction or fiction. So yes, I love doing that. What doesn't happen to me, I rarely get brand new ideas while I'm in the middle, like big ideas while I'm in the middle of traveling. I think because my senses are just so overwhelmed by the you know, I'm, I'm wanting to describe things, but I, I have, I don't think I've ever come up with like a big plot idea while traveling. But then when, when I come home again, then I have those new settings and maybe things I've observed socially, politically, um, you know, and then that can generate new ideas. But so yeah, travel is great for writing. You know, uh, you are currently training for your first half Ironman and, um, and that's connected to the writing as well, as my understanding. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, so I'm not writing about it. I keep thinking with all the time that I'm spending on this training that I should be getting some written product out of it. <laughs> you know, I myself love reading um, narratives about people taking on some challenge, whether it's a learning challenge, language challenge, sport challenge. I'm not writing about the half Ironman, but it's definitely helping me just cope. I mean, I think endurance sports have always done that for me. So before it was just running and now it's triathlon. Um, and I think there's an element cope with what you can cope, cope with, cope with the difficulty of writing, you know, so with mm. writing, it's like, you have to put in all this work doing something. I mean, even if you have, I have five published novels and many nonfiction books beyond that, but even, and I have a, sorry, I have a regular agent. I have editors I've worked with. Um, even so, every time I start a new book, I, I'm not convinced that anyone will ever read it. Um, and so at whatever level you're writing, like every day you're doing all this work and it could, it could become nothing. I mean, the whole novel could fail or somebody could not buy it or, you know, it could just have no, it could never reach the reader. And so I think sports can help because, you know, each day you go for a run, that can't be taken away from you. You don't have to have somebody give you permission to do it. You, you just go out and it's one foot in front of the other. And so I guess I'm saying I'm, I'm kind of contradicting myself because in, in ways running and triathlon are like writing and other ways are not like writing. Where it is like writing is that you just have to tackle it one day at a time. And it's, it feels difficult pretty much every day when you get started or every run, the first mile is really hard. But on the other hand, what's easier about these sports than writing is that, you know, all those things of not needing permission and just put in the work and 
it's probably going to work out. Whereas with writing, you can put in a lot of work and have to throw a lot away. So, so yeah, so it's got the parallel of this encouragement of, of small steps leading to something. And then it's got the contrast of endurance sports are almost easier than writing a book, I'd say. Now you, uh, I guess what I want to ask you, since you're, you're really a general fiction writer, you're not a genre writer, how do you choose what you write about? Do you, do you just decide or you find yourself obsessing over something and then that becomes the subject matter for your next book? Yes, exactly. It's just an idea. And, and it, it, the ideas can be inconvenient because if I'm already working on something over here or I already have a list of, of maybe ideas for the next thing and then something grabs my interest you know, the ideas are competing against each other. So I, I definitely don't start with genre or with the marketplace in that sense. I usually start with some little question or idea, something that bothers me. Indignation for me has always been a great source of ideas. Um, and I will say that when I was a young writer, I so desperately wanted to write, like I love just sitting down at the keyboard, but I didn't have any ideas. And now that I'm a much older writer, I have more ideas than I will ever have time to turn into books. Sure. Well, what are you indignant about now? <laughs> oh, let's see. Do I share this one? Are you going to be writing um, about the war in Ukraine or something like that? You're going to be making no, a trip to Ukraine? No, nothing that big. And I have to say, when when everyone else is talking about something, then it, I mean, I'm interested in Ukraine, but I'm usually not interested in writing about something that everyone right. else is talking about. It can right. be something uh, really small and odd. Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you an example, Mike. I just found out from another person this week um she she's going to be having a baby soon and she brought up the issue of nighttime nannies night nannies like night nurses mm -hmm. um which was a concept so i have two grown children you know got up and nursed them and all that and and rarely had babysitters and had a lot of support from my husband in any case in my time i was not aware of this notion of a night nanny uh, and I look, so I was so curious how much, how much they cost. They cost like from 200 to $600 a night. And I was just thinking who on earth can afford $600 a night for a person whose job it is to go pick up the baby and bring it to the mother. So the mother can nurse the baby. Like that's just blows my mind. And, and so then I just started <laughs> been googling about hey, it. pick up the pick up the baby from where i don't understand what the like the baby is asleep in the nursery or maybe the the nanny is sleeping on a bed next to the where the baby's sleeping and the night shift nanny is the, her job is just to take the baby to the mother so the mother nurse the baby and I mean, the baby back and maybe wow. okay. I, I guess maybe change it maybe do a little education of the mother if she's having trouble with nursing maybe but for the most part, oh, I see. so there may be a coaching, uh, a, uh, a kind of uh, educating them, of, particularly a first time mother on on how to properly nurse and, and yada, yada. Well, so that would make sense. And it would really make sense, especially like in the first days or somebody had a C-section or there was a health issue. But I think there's also just people who are working. I was reading in, in an article, people are working 40 to 80 hours a week, 60 to 80 hours a week mothers, new mothers. And so they want to get as good a night's sleep as possible. And so they have the night nanny. And so Mike, I'm thinking, how but is that not a wet, you're not talking about a wet nurse. This is not a woman no. who's nursing on behalf of the mother. She's no, just no. simply bringing, bringing the baby to the mother. Um, and, and then uh, allowing the nursing to take place. Yes. And your listeners right now are saying, I thought this was a writing podcast. Why are we talking? Well, it's going to be very interesting yes. to hear this. How, how are you going to tell a story that's going to captivate us all based on this? <laughs> and I'm just thinking, what kind of person can afford this? And how many people cannot afford this? And what kind of person has a newborn baby and they have to work 80 hours a week or they choose to work 80 hours a week like this? What's going on in America? This just doesn't make sense. Parents are working way too many hours, men and women both. There's no, you know, not, not enough supports, but also my gosh, I mean, to have to pay somebody $600 an hour a night. I mean, that's just a whole world I'm not familiar with. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe I should be a night nanny, Mike, maybe that's what I should do. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. A little bit of research and maybe travel to some exotic place to do it on top of that. <laughs> well, I didn't uh, even mean, <laughs> I didn't even mean his research. I just thought that sounds like a, sounds like a good wage, doesn't it? Yeah, with that kind of money, absolutely. And and obviously you've had children, so uh 
this uh, you've been around the block a few times on that. Um, let me ask you how you work. I'm always curious about how a uh, a successful writer you've done, you've obviously been very successful at what you do. When you have a novel going, I mean, are you a morning writer, evening writer? How much time do you put in? And what is a good writing day for you? Save that for 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 last. But talk about your writing regimen. Well, I think there's the regimen of what I tell I'm, myself I should do and then what I really do. <laughs> so oh, even at the, be- <laughs> at the beginning of the year, I resolve to remodel my mornings to not let myself get so caught up in news and this and that and kind of fill my brain with too much junk before I started writing. So I thought I was going to limit the pre-writing activity. So one thing I do enjoy doing, I, I enjoy studying Mandarin Chinese um, and it's, I've been doing that for a couple of years and I especially love the characters writing and reading the characters even more than speaking. So I'll let myself do my little Mandarin studies for 15 minutes and I'll do a couple little exercises or something. But then an ideal morning would be go from that. Don't get lost in email or the news and get right into a writing session. But the truth is, Mike, that's what I aim for. And that's not usually what I do because I will jump in and answer some important emails or I might have some other side work project. Um, but-, but the goal is to put in how much time and yeah. uh, how much time do you do you like say two hours at a time or do you I, say I think- a four hour writing day or what? No more than three hours. But I will Because tell- beyond that, what happens? It just, I usually hit a block. I mean, whether I'm aiming for time or word count, and I do log both, three hours is a, is a really, that takes up a lot of mental That's energy. Optimal. But yeah, I, oh yeah, it's exact. I think a lot of people don't, who have not written don't understand how exacting writing is. And when I hear people who say they write six or eight hours, I'm thinking there must be a lot of downtime in that in there because it's, it's, it's very exhausting writing. Yeah. I've only done that when I go away on writing retreats, which is another thing I do love to do, uh, whether it's, you know, once every year or two years, something like that. And then I'll have a couple, a, a long weekend or four or five days of putting in those marathon writing or revision sessions, especially revision. I've done 10, 12 hours at a stretch, but for fresh writing. So we were saying, you know, over after three hours, you get tired, but again, Mike, the truth of the matter is that there are many good days when I put in like only one hour, but if I do it almost every day, so I keep the story in the back of my mind and I'm fresh, that one hour can provide more than enough word count for the week. And I think I think math is always on our side. I think for a writer at any level, um, I was inspired recently finding out that Andre Debuse, who wrote House of Sand and Fog, which is a book I absolutely love, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. he wrote that. I don't know if you've already heard this anecdote, but that he wrote the book 20 minutes at a time. No, no. Tell me about yeah. it. He was, uh, I'm repeating a story that's been told elsewhere, but he, he, he was driving. He had a day job at that point as a teacher and he would drive to the job and there was a cemetery where he would pull out in the, in the parking lot and write for 20 minutes on the way to work. And then on the way back 20 minutes and his wife knew he was doing it, you know, so it's like, this is the structure. This is what he's expected to do. And evidently that was enough for him to write the book. And I came across this in podcasts and a couple blog posts and I thought it was so cool, but I needed to find out the answer for myself. And so I actually wrote an article for Writer's Digest and got tra- got hold of um, Andre Debuse because I just needed him to tell me that it was true. And he said it was true. You know, and, and he uh, isolates himself in that way. I mean, if he's uh, just pulling over, p- pulling into a parking lot and sitting in his car and writing for 20 minutes or a Starbucks, I'm not sure what he was doing. What was he doing? Was it was he just, just in the car. In? He was just in his yeah, so, cemetery. But there's no interruptions. There's no interruptions. You, you're isolated in, uh, um, but 20 minutes that got and it's on a the way out. Routine. 20 minutes back. And I think that's yes. where our brains really benefit from. Like, this is the signal. You've turned off the car. You're in the same location. You only have this amount of time. Expectations are limited because you can't get too much done. When we have too much freedom, it really inhibits the creative process, I think. So all right. those things. So I think we can take that lesson from Andre Debuse and say, even if I, if, I, if I do it at home or if I do it in a cafe, how can I create that sense of routine and constrained expectations in order to write a book? So maybe one of the most, I don't know if you would concur with this in your life, but the most important aspect of this is maybe just the consistency of actually writing every day. Well, so that is, I think, again, like so many things, every day sounds great, but that can also intimidate people who simply can't write every day. And so again, as a teacher and a coach, I found it more important just that to encourage people to find out what works best for them. 
You know, so if you can experiment with both ways, try writing a little bit every day, try that for, you know, a couple weeks or longer. Um, but then you might try the other method, which I know people who have written entire books only by, say, going away for retreats. So maybe they have a couple months where they can't write, but then they go away for days or a couple weeks and they can write in these bigger chunks. And if that's your life, whether you're, you know, have young kids or taking care of an aging parent and all you get is the occasional big chunks, don't lose faith because every way can work. What I do like about the super regular writing, the most important thing is just that then the book is always in your mind and you're doing most of the work away from the keyboard. You know, that's why you don't need more than maybe 20 minutes or an hour, because when you're out walking or doing the dishes, you're still telling the story in your head. You can see it like a movie. And then when you sit down to write, you're ready to go. And so when you take really big breaks, I think that back of mind, mind wandering stops happening. Wouldn't you agree with that? I think so. I think so. Um, you know, and, and what you said is true. I was going to say it and you said it bef before I did, which is just, you know, everybody writes differently and you figure out what works for you. I had a guy on a podcast a few months ago who um, said he committed to writing one word a day. And he said, but by the time you fire up the laptop uh, and you sit down, you're not just going to write one word. He said, well, there was one day where I literally wrote, just wrote one word just to keep my commitment to do it. And he said, but once you open the laptop and it's fired up, you don't just write one word. You end up writing a paragraph or two paragraphs or three pages or 10 pages, whatever, whatever you can actually accomplish that day. But he made the bar so low. I need to write my one word today. <laughs> it got him to sit and fire up the laptop. By the way, do you write uh, with a keyboard? Do you write with a machine or are you on a typewriter or do you handwrite? Key keyboard 95% of the time. Sometimes I'll, I'll have a notebook out and do longhand. Uh, just the other day, yeah, yesterday, in fact, I was, I, I won't say what I was attending, but I was attending something that was really boring. And so after about an hour, I took out my notebook and I was starting to outline a new novel idea. So that can work if you're in a meeting or something else and you're bored out of your mind, that can be a great time to make notes for a novel. Now, you're a writing coach. Have you ever have, have you ever used a writing coach yourself? Oh, that's a good question. I would love to. Um, not really. I've used coaches for studying social media and platform, and that was actually really helpful. Um, yeah, it would be, it'd be great to have a coach. I right now I've been I've been interacting so much with an agent, like on on my most recent completed book that that was almost like having a form of coaching. Um, but I'm lucky because she's a very interactive, developmentally minded agent. If you don't have that, and a lot of people don't have that, that's where the book coach steps in. One last question. Which of your characters, if you can actually say this, I know this is a tough question um, for most people anyway, which of your characters uh, did you like best? Which who, What character do you create that you're most proud of or that you have the most feel for? Anything like that. Okay, good. I thought you were going to ask me which one am I, am I most like myself, which that would be even harder. Um, as far as which one I like best. So this is, this is a funny thing. So most of my characters have been human, almost all of them. But I think my most likable character is a robot. And that's in my book, Plum Reigns. And the, the robot's name is Hero. And, you know, we've seen these AI characters, whether it's someone in a, like a Star Trek or some other, you know, future sci-fi movie, uh, an empathetic robot can be a very sympathetic character because they're, they're nicer than we are, at least in fiction. They're, they can be nicer than we are. And my, my character hero, he is threatening to displace the nurse um, because he is a better listener. He's not as distracted. He's not always looking at his phone. He actually fully attends to his client. And I think that's something that we all have a hard time doing. You've been listening to Andromeda Romano Lax and uh, learn more about her. Look at the episode notes and you'll see her website where you'll be able to get more information about her and get the proper title, titles of all of her books. Uh, and you'll get the full length bio. I, I sampled the bio, but didn't give the full length on that. Uh, Andromeda, you're a great interview. Uh, your your uh, energy level, your clarity and all. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for coming on the program. Well, thank you. It was fun, Mike.